Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, Look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow, the more knowledge, the more grief. Chapter 2 I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers, and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head while the fool walks in the darkness, but I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I thought in my heart, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. For the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. So, I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, 
is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This, too, is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This, too, is meaningless. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This, too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This, too, is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Chapter 3 There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. That everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil, this is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Whatever is has already been and what will be has been before and God will call the past to account. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I thought in my heart, God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. I also thought, as for men, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the spirit of man rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. So, I saw that there is nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work because that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Chapter 4 Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead, who had already died, are happier than the living, who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? 
this too is meaningless. A miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to take warning. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship, or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them. But those who came later were not pleased with the successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Chapter 5 Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven, and you are on earth, so let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger, My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, stand in awe of God. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This, too, is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son there is nothing left for him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. This too is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs, and what does he gain since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Then I realize that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. Chapter 6 I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on men. God gives a man wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing his heart desires. But God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning, it departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place? All man's efforts are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. What advantage has a wise man over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This, too, is meaningless, 
a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named, and what man is has been known. No man can contend with one who is stronger than he. The more the words, the less the meaning, and how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a man in life during the few and meaningless days he passes through like a shadow? Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? Chapter 7 a good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This, too, is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise man into a fool, and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, Why were the old days better than these? for it is not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, a righteous man perishing in his righteousness and a wicked man living long in his wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Wisdom makes one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in a city. There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I tested by wisdom, and I said, I am determined to be wise. But this was beyond me. Whatever wisdom may be, it is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things, and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Look, says the teacher, this is what I have discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things, while I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This only have I found. God made mankind upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes. Chapter 8 who is like the wise man, who knows the explanation of things? Wisdom brightens a man's face and changes its hard appearance. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, What are you doing? Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a man's misery weighs heavily upon him. Since no man knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? No man has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the day of his death. As no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. 
There is a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Then, too, I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This, too, is meaningless. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe man's labor on earth, his eyes not seeing sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. Chapter 9 So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so with the sinner. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. All the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man, poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man, so I said, Wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Chapter 10 As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Even as he walks along the road, the fool lacks sense and shows everyone how stupid he is. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great errors to rest. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, the sort of error that arises from a ruler. 
fools are put in many high positions while the rich occupy the low ones. I have seen slaves on horseback while princes go on foot like slaves. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. If a snake bites before it is charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. Words from a wise man's mouth are gracious, but a fool is consumed by his own lips. At the beginning, his words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness, and the fool multiplies words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell him what will happen after him? A fool's work wearies him. He does not know the way to town. Woe to you, O land, whose king was a servant and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at a proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. If a man is lazy, the rafters sag. If his hands are idle, the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter and wine makes life merry, but money is the answer for everything. Do not revile the king even in your thoughts or curse the rich in your bedroom because a bird of the air may carry your words and a bird on the wing may report what you say. Chapter 11 Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. Give portions to seven, yes, to eight, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain upon the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there will it lie. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let not your hands be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. Light is sweet and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart in whatever your eyes see. But know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. So then, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are meaningless. Chapter 12 Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark, and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. When men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred, then man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Not only was the teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails, given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. 
of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Song of Songs, Chapter 1 Solomon's Song of Songs Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. How right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me, made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I have neglected. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? If you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. I liken you, my darling, to a mare harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My lover is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My lover is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engedi. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. How handsome you are, my lover. Oh, how charming. And our bed is verdant. The beams of our house are cedars. Our rafters are firs. Chapter 2 I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. He has taken me to the banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Listen, my lover. Look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. My dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. My lover is mine, and I am his. He browses among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn, my lover, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. Chapter 3 All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city, through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? 
Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house, to the room of the one who conceived me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Who is this coming up from the desert like a column of smoke, perfume with myrrh and incense, made from all the spices of the merchant? Look, it is Solomon's carriage, escorted by sixty warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made for himself the carriage. He made it of wood from Lebanon. Its posts he made of silver, its base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple, its interior lovingly inlaid by the daughters of Jerusalem. Come out, you daughters of Zion, and look at King Solomon wearing the crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. Chapter 4 How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with elegance. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. All beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amena, from the top of Saner, the summit of Hermon from the lion's dens and the mountain haunts of the leopards. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume than any spice. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like that of Lebanon. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and aloes and all the finest spices. You are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden, that its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. Chapter 5 I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, O oh friends, and drink. Drink your fill, O oh lovers. I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. I have taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I have washed my feet. Must I soil them again? My lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my lover, and my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my cloak. 
those watchmen of the walls. O daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. How is your beloved better than others, most beautiful of women? How is your beloved better than others that you charge us so? My lover is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among ten thousand. His head is pure as gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies, dripping with myrrh. His arms are rods of gold, set with chrysolite. His body is like polished ivory, decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble, set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover, this my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Chapter 6 Where has your lover gone, most beautiful of women? Which way did your lover turn, that we may look for him with you? My lover has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to browse in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my lover's, and my lover is mine. He browses among the lilies. You are beautiful, my darling, as Terza, lovely as Jerusalem, majestic as troops with banners. Turn your eyes from me. They overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Sixty queens there may be, and eighty concubines, and virgins beyond number. But my dove, my perfect one, is unique. The only daughter of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The maiden saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines praised her. Who is this that appears like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, majestic as the stars in procession? I went down to the grove of nut trees to look at the new growth in the valley, to see if the vines had budded or the pomegranates were in bloom. Before I realized it, my desire set me among the royal chariots of my people. Come back, come back, O Shulamite, come back, come back that we may gaze on you. Why would you gaze on the Shulamite as on the dance of Mahanaim? Chapter 7 How beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter! Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of a craftsman's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are the pools of Heshbon by the gate of bath -Rabbim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing, O oh love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of the palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like the clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. May the wine go straight to my lover, flowing gently over lips and teeth. I belong to my lover, and his desire is for me. Come, my lover, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes send out their fragrance, and at our door is every delicacy both new and old. That I have stored up for you, my lover. Chapter 8 If only you were to me like a brother who was nursed at my mother's breast, then if I found you outside, I would kiss you and no one would despise me. I would lead you and bring you to my mother's house, she who has taught me. 
I would give you spiced wine to drink, the nectar of my pomegranates. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Who is this coming up from the desert, leaning on her lover? Under the apple tree I roused you. There your mother conceived you. There she who was in labor gave you birth. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. We have a young sister, and her breasts are not yet grown. What shall we do for our sister, for the day she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build towers of silver on her. If she is a door, we will enclose her with panels of cedar. I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Thus I have become in his eyes like one bringing contentment. Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Haman. He let out his vineyard to tenants. Each was to bring for its fruit a thousand shekels of silver, but my own vineyard is mine to give. The thousand shekels are for you, O Solomon, and two hundred are for those who tend its fruit. You who dwell in the gardens with friends and attendants, let me hear your voice. Come away, my lover, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. <laughs> 